Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host with another marvelous video. As far as pop culture is concerned, gods and beings from higher planes living amidst ordinary humans. This cinematic approach transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary, with fish out of water characters navigating a world brimming with humorous misunderstandings and intricate conflicts. From Marvel's superhero shaking the natural order to its core, to the pacifist extraterrestrial E.T., the collision of worlds never fails to attract us, and somewhere around the epicenter of this beautiful and marvelous approach lies the iconic Highlander franchise, a saga that blends this narrative sword with masterful precision to land a super compelling climactic strike. Immortal warriors born from the Scottish Highlands are propelled into a centuries-old battle for ultimate survival. In their world and lives, death is but a distant concept, only attainable through beheading, or else no mortal wounds have the power to kill them. Almost synonymous with the franchise is Connor McLeod, the protagonist played by Christopher Lambert in the first two movies, whose journey through time and eternity is both enchanting and immortal. Mortal. But he's not alone. There have been several more bearing his name who have fought evil and lived to tell the tale. In this video, we'll explore the entire Highlander franchise, including movies, TV shows, and anime. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. There can be only one. Number 1. There Can Be Only One Highlander 1986 Movie According to the original film, Conor McLeod, the immortal, was born in a village called Glenfinnan on the shores of Loch Shiel in the year 1518. When he turned 18, he went to his first battle in the year 1536 against Clan Fraser. However, Clan Fraser was being helped by an evil immortal named the Kurgan, who knew that Conor hadn't yet realized the true nature of his abilities. Kurgan wanted to decapitate Conor on the battlefield to ensure that there was one less immortal to fight. When the battle started, none of the members of Clan Fraser attacked Connor because Kurgan wanted to finish Connor himself. Connor's bewilderment about none of the Frasers attacking him came to a halt when Kurgan approached him, and the Russian warlord Kurgan left Connor mortally wounded. He was proceeding to decapitate Connor, but the latter was saved when other MacLeods forced Kurgan to run for his life. After the battle was over, Clan MacLeod mourned the loss of their fallen comrade, but he miraculously came back from the dead. To be honest, it did feel a bit like Jon Snow's resurrection in Game of Thrones. But while Jon's return was hailed, Connor's clan turned against him, claiming that the devil lived within him. They wanted to burn Connor to death, but a man named Angus ensured that Connor was merely banished from the clan. After this, Connor McLeod became a blacksmith in a place called Glencoe and married a beautiful girl named Heather. In the year 1541, his whereabouts were discovered by an older immortal named Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, played by Sean Connery. Ramirez introduced himself and explained that the discomfort Connor experienced in the presence of both the Kurgan and Ramirez was known as the Quickening. Ramirez took it upon himself to become McLeod's mentor, imparting knowledge about immortality, swordsmanship, the pursuit of the prize, and the intricate rules governing an ancient game. This ongoing contest would culminate during a final event called The Gathering, where the remaining immortals would vie for supremacy, with the ultimate goal being the solitary survivor, which is how the immortals became obsessed with the tagline, There can be only one. Furthermore, death for immortals came solely through decapitation and they were prohibited from combat on consecrated or holy grounds such as churches. Ramirez wielded a katana, a sword he obtained in Japan around 593 BC crafted by his then father-in-law, Masamune. This master swordsmith, well ahead of his era in blade forging, was the father of Shikiko, Ramirez's third and final spouse. Ramirez issued a somber warning to MacLeod, urging him to consider leaving Heather to avoid inevitable heartbreak. He implored MacLeod to spare himself such anguish and release Heather from their relationship, especially since immortals were incapable of bearing children. Despite this counsel, MacLeod remained resolute in his commitment to Heather, though he continued to learn from Ramirez. Under Ramirez's tutelage, MacLeod delved into the history of the Kurgan and comprehended the dire consequences that could transpire if Kurgan were to claim the prize. One fateful night, Kurgan attacked Heather and Ramirez when McLeod wasn't home. Ramirez managed to slash Kurgan's throat, an injury that altered his voice but fell short of ending his life. Eventually, Kurgan overpowered Ramirez and severed his head to claim the quickening. But that's not all. Believing that Heather was Ramirez's woman, Kurgan also assaulted her. Later, McLeod came home to face the grim reality. His mentor lay lifeless, and his wife, though physically alive, or the scars of a traumatic encounter. MacLeod stood by Heather's side until the twilight of her years, her final moment spent in his gentle embrace. It was in the year 1985 in New York City that the gathering took place. It was a climactic series of confrontations destined to determine the ultimate victor of something called the Prize. Connor's first opponent was Iman Fazil. Their duel swayed in both
both directions, but in the end, McLeod decapitated Fazil, absorbing his quickening. Collecting himself, Connor carefully concealed his sword within an overhead grating before leaving the garage. However, he found himself cornered by the arriving police officers who were responding to the earlier disturbance. Subjected to questioning, Connor denied involvement in the deaths of both Fazil and Oster Vazilek, another immortal who had died in New Jersey just two nights ago. Despite their suspicions, the police lacked concrete evidence, ultimately releasing Connor, albeit as their primary person of interest. It was then that Connor came across Brenda Wyatt, portrayed by Roxanne Hart, a skilled forensic scientist with an extensive knowledge of sword history. Her analysis of evidence from the crime scene revealed that the murder weapon was at least two millennia old. Later, Brenda tells McLeod and becomes embroiled in a skirmish between Kurgan and McLeod, but the fight is halted due to a police chopper. A few days later, Connor meets his friend and fellow immortal Sander Castagir at Central Park. However, Castagir's chapter concludes abruptly as he confronts Kurgan. Clearly outmatched by Kurgan's ferocious skills, Castagir meets his demise. With Castagir's death, Kurgan and Connor become the only two immortals left, both preparing for an epic showdown. Kurgan meets Connor in a church and reveals the details of Ramirez's death and his actions against Heather. Unknowingly sealing his fate, Kurgan brags about his crimes against Heather to Connor. Aware of Brenda and Connor's relationship, Kurgan kidnaps her, using her as bait to draw Connor into the final battle. Of course, Connor takes the bait and arrives at an abandoned movie studio, where Kurgan awaits. Upon reaching the rooftop, he discovers Brenda tethered to a neon sign. As he attempts to free her, Kurgan emerges from the shadows. Connor deftly evades Kurgan's strikes triggering a sequence of events that culminate in the collapse of the neon sign. The falling sign knocks down a neighboring water tower, flooding the roof. Brenda manages to escape the wreckage just in time to witness both combatants plummet through a skylight into the building below. Brenda intervenes, striking Kurgan with a piece of pipe, diverting his attention and allowing Connor to retrieve his katana. Swiftly, he shields Brenda from harm and engages Kurgan once again. The two adversaries lock swords in a final showdown, and with each clash, Kurgan experiences the agony of steel piercing his flesh. The balance of power shifts in Connor's favor. What Kurgan feels now is a mixture of fear and madness. Capitalizing on this vulnerability, Connor beheads Kurgan. With this victory, Connor gains the prize and the ability to discern the thoughts of humanity, shaping their destinies. Connor embraces a life of potential aging, nurturing relationships, and siring offspring with Brenda. Number 2. It's time for a new kind of magic. Highlander 2 The Quickening 1991 movie. In the year 2024, the film opens with a backdrop of environmental devastation caused by industrial pollution, resulting in the depletion of Earth's ozone layer. So, yes, the film is slightly futuristic and almost apocalyptic in nature. The planet is now vulnerable to the sun's harsh rays. To safeguard against this solar threat, an electromagnetic shield was established in 1999 to shield the world from the sun's potential harm. A faction, however, challenges the continued necessity of the shield, suggesting that the ozone layer has naturally restored itself. Nonetheless, their assumptions remain unverified. Meanwhile, in an opera theatre, the aging and retired former immortal Connor McLeod is engrossed in a performance of Wagner's Gotterdammerung. Amidst the grandeur, Connor drifts into slumber, momentarily awakened by a change in the musical cues. Within the theatre, he spots Dr. Alan Naiman, an acquaintance of his. As the opera singers carry on with their performance, Connor's attention is drawn to a cloaked singer who stirs memories of his past on the distant planet Zeist. This serves as a backstory of Connor McLeod, but this is contradictory to the established Highlander canon as the film turns them into aliens, inexplicably resurrects Ramirez and also changes the concept of quickening. Anyway, Connor remembers the history of Zeist, a world aeons ago where a rebellion orchestrated by Connor and Ramirez stood against the tyranny of cruel slavers led by the deranged General Katana. Despite their defiance, their resistance crumbled and instead of execution, Connor and Ramirez had to face banishment to planet Earth. Connor finds himself aged, frail and on the brink of death after successfully defeating the final immortal Kurgan and reaping the ultimate prize, mortality. But as I said, this is against what was established in the first film. A radio broadcast the questionable actions of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Corporation, implicated in criminal and unethical price fixing, which prompts Connor to go there to address the issues with the new and corrupt CEO, David Blake. However, considering his limited influence, he realizes that a face-to-face -face meeting is unfeasible and abandons the plan. Along his way, he encounters a group of street toughs who recognize him as McLeod, and although they 
could probably have taken him out, they get afraid and run away. Meanwhile, the Shield Corporation is infiltrated by a masked group of eco-terrorists who are led by Luis Marcus. Meanwhile, Connor realizes that his wounds have once again started to heal miraculously, a phenomenon he can't comprehend or explain. Meanwhile, on the distant planet Zeist, Katana grows impatient with Connor's continued existence on Earth. Despite Connor's impending death from illness in a matter of weeks, Katana fears he might return to Zeist, and Katana sends two of his winged henchmen to Earth to eliminate Connor. To be honest, their acting and the way they're directed are some of the worst I've seen in movies. Emerging from a vivid flashback, Connor McLeod encounters Louise Marcus. Louise provides evidence suggesting the ozone layer's potential recovery, and the corporation's concealed motives for financial gain. She implores Connor to join her in dismantling the shield, but he declines, citing his age, but more importantly, he thinks of her as a terrorist and wants to have nothing to do with her. Meanwhile, General Katana's assassins Corda and Reno reach Earth with orders to eliminate Connor. Despite initial struggles, McLeod prevails against both foes, harnessing their quickenings to rejuvenate and summon Ramirez back to life. Ramirez reawakens at the sight of his demise in the first movie in Glencoe, Scotland, and eventually finds his way to Connor's location. The way he gets there is quite interesting, as Sean Connery does bring a certain style to the character of Ramirez. His treasured earring proves useful enabling him to acquire new attire and secure a plane ticket to New York. But I'm still confused about how he managed to get a passport and visa. Simultaneously, General Katana arrives on Earth, driven by a relentless determination to personally end Connor's existence. The trio of Connor, Ramirez, and Louise formulate a strategy to bring down the Shield. Katana forms an unhappy alliance with David Blake, the head of the Shield Corporation, aiming to eliminate Connor. The discovery of conclusive proof, courtesy of Naaman, that the ozone layer has indeed repaired itself, leads to Naaman's imprisonment when Blake reacts unfavorably to the revelation. Connor, Ramirez, and Louise infiltrate the prison to rescue Naaman, but their efforts are marred by Naaman's demise and Ramirez's ultimate sacrifice, selflessly saving his comrades from a deadly trap. Blake also meets his demise at the hands of Katana and Connor confronts Katana in a climactic battle. Ultimately emerging victorious, Connor severs Katana's head, harnessing the combined energy of their quickening to disable the shield. The world is graced with the sight of a night sky for the first time in years, signaling the successful culmination of their endeavor. Number 3. Highlander the series, 1992-1998 TV series. The pilot episode introduced Duncan MacLeod along with his girlfriend Tessa Knoll, portrayed by Alexandra Vandernoot. They led a tranquil life as co-owners of their antique shop named MacLeod and Noel Antiques. But things changed because of a chance encounter with Richie Ryan, who attempted to pilfer from their establishment. This thrust Richie into a confrontation involving Duncan, a malevolent immortal Slan Quince, and Duncan's fellow clansman, Connor MacLeod. According to the show, Duncan had lived for nearly four centuries and was one of the longer living immortals dwelling in the world as he'd managed to avoid skirmishes with other immortals going for the prize or playing the deadly game. However, Connor's arrival forced Duncan's return to the immortal conflict, fighting on the side of righteousness against malevolence. And as we already know, this game symbolized the immortals' pursuit of one another, driven by a quest for quickenings attained through decapitation. Duncan, having withdrawn from the game, had concealed himself from his fellow immortals. However, the threat of Quince's pursuit compelled him to engage once more. As the premiere episode reached its climax, Max, Duncan vanquished Slan Quince, resuming his entanglement in the game. Subsequent episodes delved into Duncan MacLeod's interactions with both mortals and fellow immortals. The theme of relationships permeated the series and highlighted Duncan's connections with friends, family, romantic partners, and even adversaries. Evolutions in the characters and their connections gradually became an important subject of the series. Probably the most attractive pull factor of the show was its ability to develop characters in a very skilled manner. Duncan MacLeod, initially portrayed as a wise and unyielding immortal, undergoes a transformation that sees him questioning his purpose. His companion, Richie Ryan, evolves from a young, well-intentioned thief to a hardened and cynical immortal. The show also delves into the complexities that come with being a villain, exploring the nuanced factors that contribute to a person's evil actions. And to be honest, Highlander is a story where even protagonists engage in beheadings to ensure their survival. While the early episodes occasionally present Duncan's perspective as unassailably correct due to narrative convenience, this aspect improves in the subsequent seasons. Episodes like The Valkyrie, and forgive us our trespassers, in season 5 are quite introspective in nature, highlighting how Duncan is not exempt from committing questionable acts for what he perceives as just reasons. The series focuses on how no one views themselves as a villain in their own story. The heart of Highlander the series centers on life choices and personal moral codes. Co-creator David Abramovitz's description of the show as a Talmudic discussion with ass-kicking does underscore its exploration of philosophical themes amidst this action-packed story. And to this day, Highlander remains a quintessential product of the 90s in many aspects. Wow! 
1994, The Final Conflict, Highlander 3, The Sorcerer, 1994 movie. Highlander 3, The Sorcerer, an alternate sequel to the original, takes place following the passing of Conor McLeod's beloved wife, Heather, in the 16th century. The immortal Scottish Highlander begins his journey to Japan, seeking tutelage under Nakano, an immortal sorcerer. Nakano, an esteemed companion of Connor's late mentor, Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, imparts his mastery of illusion and trains McLeod in the art of katana combat, using Ramirez's sword. However, their sanctuary is soon disrupted by the evil immortal named Kane, and two of his henchmen, Kabul Khan and Sengi Khan, which is clearly a wordplay on Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan. The trio's violent rampage culminates in the destruction of a village, leading them to Nakano's cave, and Kane manages to kill Nakano, seizing his quickening and powers. As Nakano's final act triggers a cave collapse, imprisoning Cave and his henchmen, presumably keeping them away from the gathering. After this, the movie jumps to 1788 France, where Conor McLeod encounters Sarah Barrington, a visitor from England, and they kindle a deep romantic connection. The events of the French Revolution engulf them, resulting in McLeod's wrongful conviction for treason against the infamous King Louis XVI. To spare Connor from death, his fellow immortal friend Pierre Boucher takes his place, willingly embracing the end of his own immortal existence. Meanwhile, Sarah, under the impression of Connor's demise, moves on with her life and marries someone else. When McLeod eventually reunites with her, he recognizes her newfound happiness and chooses not to meddle in her life. After another time jump, we reach the year 1985, when the climactic gathering takes place in the heart of New York City, seemingly leaving Connor McLeod as the sole surviving immortal. Alongside his newfound love, Brenda Wyatt, McLeod relocates to his ancestral home in Scotland, where the two get married. But McLeod's life is never truly happy for a long time, and tragedy strikes in 1987 when Brenda meets her untimely end in a car accident. Of course, McLeod remains unscathed. By 1994, McLeod had forged a life in Marrakesh, caring for his adopted son, John. On the other side of the world, archaeologist Dr. Alexandra Johnson embarks on a quest to excavate the fabled cave of Nakano, which obviously leads to an inadvertent release of Kane. Kane seizes an opportunity by beheading his accomplice, Shengi, to gain his power, and Kabul is sent on a mission to locate Connor McLeod. Perceiving the surge of quickening once again, McLeod realizes that the eternal game is far from over, compelling him to return to the urban jungle of New York City. Under his old alias, Russell Nash, McLeod confronts and defeats Kabul, leaving a trail of evidence that rekindles suspicions of a headhunter killer. Meanwhile, Alexandra discovers a fragment of kilt cloth in Nakano's cave and forms a connection between the McLeod clan and a history of banishment due to supernatural abilities. Tracking down Russell Nash, Alex becomes a first-hand witness to his confrontation with Kane. Their intense clash ends after McLeod's sword shatters, possibly due to the sanctity of holy ground, which allows Kane to escape. McLeod eventually reforges a katana and discloses his true identity to Alex. United by their shared purpose, McLeod learns that Kane has abducted his son, John. The inevitable clash between McLeod and Kane takes place within the walls of an abandoned power plant in Jersey City. After a fierce struggle, McLeod severs Kane's head, securing victory and claiming the ultimate prize. As the culmination of centuries of immortality courses through his veins, McLeod emerges as the sole possessor of the timeless power harnessed by all those who once participated in the game. With Alex and John by his side, McLeod retreats to the serene Scottish landscape, ready to embrace the remainder of his natural life. Number 5 Highlander, the animated series, 1994 to 1996. Set in the distant future of the 27th century, the Highlander animated series takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth scarred by the aftermath of a meteorite impact and subsequent nuclear devastation. Against this bleak backdrop, the story centers on the final living descendant of the original Highlander, locked in an eternal struggle against the tyrannical ruler Cortan. In the wake of the catastrophe, the immortals, including Connor McLeod, decide to change their means and ways, forsaking the ancient game of combat that aim to secure the prize through the elimination of all but one immortal, they adopt a new mission. Renouncing their swords and assuming the title of jetators, derived from the French word jeté, meaning thrown away, they pledge to safeguard human knowledge and champion the cause of humanity itself. Yet, within this new order, one immortal named Cortan resists the oath and clings to his ambition of seizing the prize while harboring intentions of world domination. Connor confronts Cortan in a decisive duel, meeting his demise as punishment for breaking the immortal oath. However, Connor's death sets in motion a prophecy, heralding the emergence of a fresh immortal unbound by the oath. This newly risen warrior is destined to challenge and defeat Cortan, who, by now, has established an empire from his fortress Magon. Centuries later, a courageous young Highland boy named Quinton valiantly defends his clan, the Dundee, against Cortan's oppressive forces, and that's how Quinton gets pulled into the immortal struggle. Proclaimed as the prophesied immortal, 
Quinton McLeod from Clan McLeod, he's thrust into a journey that would eventually reshape the destiny of humanity. Guided by Jetator Don Vicente Marino Ramirez, who becomes his mentor, Quinton embraces his role and trains to confront Cortan. Journeying alongside his adoptive sister Clyde and their loyal companion Gaul, Quinton begins his quest to gather the quickening and knowledge of the Jetators. Unlike the traditional method of beheading, the quickening is shared through the simultaneous grasp of a sword, often leading to the Jetator becoming mortal with the accumulation of wisdom and strength. Quinton aspires to vanquish Cortan and restore balance to a shattered world. Despite its visually appealing redesign to attract a younger audience, the animated series remains surprisingly mature and intense. The story deals with complex themes of morality, portraying characters on both sides of the conflict with shades of grey. Minor characters meet their fates in the midst of the ongoing battles, and Cortan's brutal method of acquiring power contrasts with Quinton's more compassionate approach. Throughout the journey, Quinton is tested by his own temptations and flaws, yet ultimately his innate goodness prevails. Number 6. Highlander The Raven 1998-1999 TV Series Highlander The Raven was a brief but notable spin-off originating from Highlander The Series, and it extended the immortal narrative to a new female protagonist. In its pilot, the charming and immortal thief Amanda crosses paths with Nick Wolf, an inquisitive police officer delving into a string of mysterious and inexplicable robberies. As the investigation proceeds, Amanda finds herself caught in a web of deception, framed for a murder masterminded by a corrupt cop in Nick's department. Although Amanda's name is eventually cleared, the unfortunate incident leads to the tragic sacrifice of Nick's partner, Claudia Hoffman, who gives her life to protect Amanda. This event reveals Amanda's true nature as an immortal, as Nick bears witness to her death and miraculous revival. Claudia's selfless act leaves an indelible mark on Amanda, prompting a transformative journey throughout the rest of the story. With Nick's steadfast ethical principles guiding her, Amanda embarks on a path of redemption and strives to evolve into a person of virtue. Her introspection deepens when she confronts her own haunting past, realizing that her actions led to the demise of a battalion of soldiers during World War I. This newfound awareness fuels her determination to face fellow immortals head-on, even in circumstances where victory seems impossible. Number 7. In the end, there can be only one. Highlander Endgame 2000 Movie Highlander Endgame is the fourth installment in the Highlander film series and effectively continues the intertwined stories of both the original 1986 Highlander film and the subsequent television series, which also includes the spin-off Highlander The Raven. The story takes place in the year 1555 as Conor McLeod ventures back to his childhood home in Glenfinnan, Scotland, with the intent of rescuing his mother from the clutches of village priest Jacob Kell. Tragically, Kell condemns and executes Connor's mother on charges of witchcraft. Fueled by grief and rage, Connor retaliates by ending both Kell and his adoptive father, Father Rainey. In the aftermath, Glenfinnan is consumed by flames, and Connor departs, bearing his mother's lifeless body. Kell, reborn as an immortal, swears vengeance against Connor for Rainey's demise, initiating a centuries-long pursuit of revenge. Kell flouts the established rules of the game, gathering power by enlisting lesser immortals as his disciples and manipulating their strengths to eliminate other other immortals. Following the downfall of the Kurgan, Kell inflicts another grievous blow by killing Rachel Ellenstein, Connor's adopted daughter. Stricken with grief, Connor withdraws to the Sanctuary, a haven for immortals monitored by a faction of Watchers, which was an organization committed to preventing the conclusion of the game. A decade later, Kell and his followers orchestrate an assault on the Sanctuary, resulting in the presumed demise of Connor and other immortals within. Duncan MacLeod, compelled by a haunting vision of the massacre, immediately begins his journey in search of the truth. Duncan leaves London for New York, where he visits Connor's now destroyed loft. As Duncan senses the presence of another immortal, he meets Kate, his former wife from two centuries past. However, Cal and his accomplices also arrive there, and Duncan finds himself incapacitated by the end. However, he's saved when a van arrives out of nowhere and transports the fallen Duncan away from the scene. Upon regaining consciousness, Duncan discovers that he's been captured by the Watchers, who aim to confine him within the sanctuary, preventing any immortal from claiming the prize, but he does manage to escape. To make matters worse, Kell seeks to torment Connor by killing Duncan. Encouraged by Kell to strike him down, Connor's inner turmoil stemming from the loss of his loved ones renders him defenseless against Kell's might, which, of course, leads to his defeat. Furthermore, Kate, who now calls herself Faith, aligns herself with Kell, but she doesn't want power. What she yearns for 
there is a life without immortality, where she could experience the joys of motherhood and aging. Duncan strives to mend their fractured bond, realizing the significance of gaining Kate's forgiveness, or else facing her as a hardened member of Kel's faction. The climactic showdown seems like a macabre replication of The Last Supper, seeking to absorb the powers of his followers, potentially including Faith. Meanwhile, Connor implores Duncan to accept the former's fate, revealing that Duncan must decapitate Connor to amass the strength needed to rival Kel. Tearfully, Duncan obliges, but that's not the end for Connor. In the final moments, Connor's spirit takes hold of Duncan, infusing him with renewed resolve. Duncan severs Kel's head and exacts retribution for Connor and the others. By absorbing Kel's power, Duncan emerges as the most formidable immortal. He travels to Glencoe, Scotland, laying Connor to rest alongside Heather and Ramirez. In the producer's cut, after Duncan pays his final respects to Connor, Kate emerges, revealing that Kel spared her life. Renouncing her faith persona, Kate embraces her true identity and reconciles with Duncan. Go! Don't move, or I Number 8. The Methos Chronicles 2001 web series. The Methos Chronicles is a flash animated web series centered around the character Methos, drawn from Highlander, the series. Methos was traveling to Tokyo, Japan when he caught a news broadcast on television announcing a significant discovery near the Aswan High Dam in southern Egypt. Dr. Mina Abadi, the head of the Egyptian Museum's archaeology team, revealed the unearthing of a sarcophagus in an underground tomb beneath the Aswan River. The news brought some memories to Methos about a painful past that stretched back several millennia to his time in Egypt. Once upon a time, he was married to a nomad girl and shared a life in the unforgiving deserts of Sinai. Though life was challenging, they managed to live happily. However, their world was shattered by an assault orchestrated by Pharaoh Jair, who ordered the eradication of all nomads residing within his domain. This brutal event became known as the Smiting of the Sinai. Methos' wife fell victim to the attack, and Methos himself faced a temporary death. He struggled in the desert, enduring hunger, thirst, and countless deaths. Yet death offered him no lasting reprieve. He was eventually apprehended for pilfering figs and faced a death sentence. However, Pharaoh Jair intervened, sparing Methos' life due to his own immortality. In the present day, Methos toured the Egyptian Museum in Cairo in the company of Dr. Ketemi, the museum's director. His objective was to meet Dr. Mina Abadi and discuss the mysterious sarcophagus and his scarab of sword. Number 9. The legendary adventure continues, Highlander The Source 2007 movie. Directed by Brett Leonard, Highlander The Source serves as the fifth and final installment of the Highlander film series. However, it departs from the original Highlander narrative and continues the story of immortal swordsman Duncan MacLeod, portrayed by Adrian Paul, in alignment with the continuity of Highlander The Series. In a near future world, society has descended into chaos, with territorial conflicts and rampant violence among warring gangs. Amid this turmoil, a faction of immortals retains access to advanced technology and resources, comprising individuals like the ancient Methos, skilled hacker Reggie, formidable warrior Zai Ji, and Cardinal Giovanni, representing the Vatican. The group is determined to uncover the secrets of the source of immortality. Zai Ji appears to have stumbled upon a potential lead, but meets a swift death at the hands of the Guardian, a monstrous immortal with supernatural swiftness. Recognizing the need for assistance, Methos enlists the help of his longtime friend Joe Dawson to locate and bring Duncan MacLeod into the fold. Duncan MacLeod, separated from his mortal wife due to his infertility, roams the desolate wastelands. His solitary journey is disrupted when he crosses paths with the Guardian, and the two engage in a brief yet intense battle. Shortly thereafter, Joe Dawson reaches out to recruit Duncan, who accepts the offer and arrives at a monastery. Their goal is to rendezvous with the Elder, an ancient being possessing knowledge that can guide them toward the source. They also meet Anna Tashemka, whose visions are intricately tied to the enigmatic source. The Elder, a figure in a state of perpetual decay, reveals the history of immortals who once discovered the source in ancient times. The consequences of their actions led to a curse, which led to the birth of the Guardian as well as the decaying Elder. He also reveals that Anna's visions hold the key to their path. However, the Elder warns that as they approach the source, their own strength will diminish. In an anticlimactic confrontation, the Guardian attacks Reggie and Joe Dawson on holy ground. In a desperate bid to rescue Dawson, Duncan hurls his katana at the Guardian, causing a temporary injury. Unyielding, the Guardian shatters the sword and kills Joe before making his escape. Following a somber burial for Joe, Duncan and his companion set out on a mission to locate the source. Their quest leads them to an island off the Lithuanian coast, a territory controlled by savage cannibalistic gangs. Battling the hostile locals, the group reaches a deserted house near the suspected location of the source. 
Under cover of darkness, tragedy strikes again as the Guardian targets Reggie, whose proximity to the source prevents his wounds from healing, ultimately leading to his demise. With Reggie laid to rest, the determined group presses onward. It was now that Duncan and Methos unraveled the true meaning behind the phrase, there can be only one. Contrary to its conventional interpretation, it becomes evident that the expression does not pertain to the last surviving immortal who claims the prize. Instead, it signifies that only a single immortal can harness the complete power of the source. Duncan and Methos eventually break free from the captivity of cannibals who had previously held them. Methos comes to realize that Duncan's unwavering integrity and purity of heart make him the true embodiment of the One. In a final showdown, Duncan locates Anna, and the Guardian challenges him. Anna's connection with the Source becomes apparent, and when Duncan attempts to join her, an impenetrable energy barrier obstructs his path. Despite the odds, Duncan manages to immobilize the Guardian, burying him up to his neck in the Earth. As the Guardian's defeat becomes inevitable, he implores Duncan to end his cursed existence, but Duncan refuses uses, and the Guardian vanishes in a brilliant surge of light, seemingly cursed forever. Who are you? Colin McLeod. Number 10. Highlander – The Search for Vengeance 2007 Anime Highlander The Search for Vengeance, despite its somewhat whimsical title, stands as a remarkable gift to Highlander fans of all ages. Guided by the legendary Yoshiaki Kawajiri, renowned for his work on the anime classic Ninja Scroll, Search for Vengeance boasts an impressive fusion of violence, drama, sensuality, and intellect. The story revolves around a fresh protagonist named Colin McLeod, hailing from the clan McLeod. However, the film doesn't elaborate much on his connection to either Duncan of the films or Connor McLeod. Colin resides in a futuristic New Jersey on the edge of dystopia, combining aesthetics reminiscent of Blade Runner and the chaotic essence of Mad Max beyond Thunderdome, with a hint of Terminator 2. As an immortal bounty hunter, Colin ekes out a modest existence in a world grappling with pollution, terrorism, and rampant viral outbreaks. Upon delivering a captured bounty to the fortified metropolis, Colin is taken aback to learn that the city is under the iron rule of a despotic dictator. His immortal arch-enemy, Marcus Octavius. In league with a band of rebel insurgents, including the resilient and captivating Dahlia, Colin embarks on a daring campaign to breach Marcus's citadel and exact his vengeance. The film artfully employs the signature Highlander-style flashbacks, seamlessly interweaving character histories, a storytelling device that later profoundly influenced TV shows ranging from the whimsical to the masterful. Throughout the story, vengeance escorts us through the annals of history, transporting us to the tumultuous clan wars of the Scottish Highlands, the opulent excesses of ancient Rome and the dogfights over the skies of World War II-era England. Interestingly, the combat sequences, including obligatory sword duels, rise to an extraordinary level of excellence. Furthermore, the film treats us to genuinely multi-dimensional characters. If any aspect of Search for Vengeance could be considered a drawback, it might be the occasional resemblance to the original film. Familiar elements are thrown around such as a wise mentor like Sean Connery's Ramirez, a malevolent adversary like Kurgan, responsible for the demise of our hero's wife, and even a scene that resembles the one where Scotsman exiled Connor after suspecting him of harboring a demon within himself. Marvelous verdicts. As far as pop culture phenomena go, few can rival the magnetic allure of the Highlander franchise. Gregory Wilden transformed an undergraduate assignment into cinematic gold, and we couldn't be happier. As an immortal locked in an eternal dance of duels for supremacy, McLeod's journey has been punctuated by electrifying clashes, iconic dashes, and enthralling love stories. Through each violent clash and heart-pounding escapade, audiences have witnessed the indomitable spirit of Connor and other unforgettable champions like Duncan and Colin McLeod. And you know what? The franchise's penchant for repetition and its unapologetically campy style have done little to dampen the fervor of its dedicated fan base, who simply can't seem to quench their thirst for this peculiar and ever-expanding narrative. But of course, the franchise is not for everyone, and one needs to acquire the taste of loving a Highlander film or show. But once you do, you'll feel like the franchise has aged like fine wine over time. If there's a specific topic or character you want us to explore from the Highlander universe, you know where to reach us. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.